Hello, welcome to Come Learn with Paula. I'm so glad that you'll be joining me today. We will be going through John chapter 11. So grab your Bibles, open them up, John chapter 11. If you need to watch a previous video, do so. If you wanna go ahead and work on this study a little bit before we go through it, then click the more button down below and it'll give the lesson and go ahead and work on it and hop back on. Um, otherwise, we can just stay on together and discuss it. So I'm gonna start with the opening paragraph and it starts out with, hi friends. Just to recap our study a little, isn't it wonderful how John reveals different aspects of Jesus's character to us? John begins with Jesus as the word made flesh, the lamb of God and the living water. Then we see several I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. And this week we will see another I am statement, Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Let's get started. Okay, questions for chapter 11, 1 through 45. And our first question is, as our story begins, we, who is involved in this passage and what additional information do you know about them? So we're going to read verses 1 and 2, find out what we find out about who's involved. <clears throat> then we're going to go back and check this Luke passage out. Okay, so let's start with verses 1 and 2 of chapter 11. It says, now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother now lay sick, is the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. Okay, so several things here. It's a man named Lazarus, and he's sick. So we know Lazarus is sick. We know that um, Mary and Martha are sisters. And we know that Mary is the brother of Lazarus. So now we know that all three of them are related, brothers and sisters. And Mary has previously poured oil on Jesus's head and wiped her feet, or on his feet actually, and wiped it with her hair. Okay, so what else do you know about Mary and Martha? Um, one of the familiar passages that I'm thinking of is in Luke <clears throat> chapter 10, verses 36 through 42. And it's when um, it, it, when Jesus had come to their house and he was going to have a meal with them and Martha was busy in the kitchen and Mary was sitting at Jesus's feet. So they loved him. They, they served food to him. Um, they received counsel from him and direction. They were, I think they were like, a, you know, not family, but you know, you have those friends that feel like family. I think that these were people that felt like family uh, to each other. Okay, in question number two, it says the sisters were concerned about their brother and sent word to Jesus. How do you think they sent the word and how long do you think it took? What was Jesus's response? So I'm thinking that, you know, right now we can pray to God and and go immediately uh, through Jesus to God, to the throne of grace. But, you know, it took them a while to get this message to Jesus because it was, it was physical. And I'm thinking it must have been about a day's walk because... Um, it talks about um, it talks about Jesus staying two more days where he was, and then when he gets to the grave, Lazarus had been dead for four days. So if it was a day there to let him know, and he died on the way, then uh, two days back or two days before he left, and then one day back, that would be about four days. So it wasn't that easy to get a message out at this time. I do want to read uh, verses three and four. Let's see what else we can find from this information. It says, so the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. So it didn't say won't die. It says it won't end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Oh my, some of the things that we go through that are so hard are to bring glory to God and revelation to us. Isn't that interesting? I also love what he says, Lord, the one you love is sick. You know, they loved Jesus. They felt loved by Jesus. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus. And he's like, he's sick. Oh, so he's really sick. And Jesus, of course, knew. He knew all about it. And then he waited. Oh, okay. Question number three. The Bible says that Jesus loved Mar Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And yet he waited two more days before going to them. How could this be loving? Okay, I'm going to read five and six and then let's talk about it. Okay, so verse five says, 
Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Oh, this is to me a hard part of this passage because in my mind, if you love someone, you do everything you could, get there, be there, take care of the situation, right? But um, we have already read that it says this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. So at this time, they had seen lots of miracles um, Jesus had done, and they'd, he'd even raised people from the dead. But in but this was a different um, situation because he was going to have, have been dead for four days. There were lots of people there witnessing this situation because they were going to comfort Mary and Martha as they grieved. So Jesus knew that it would be best if this miracle were done correctly. And according to God, correctly meant he needed to stay there two more days. I bet those would have been two very hard days for Jesus and two very hard days for Mary and Martha. So just think about it because sometimes we have some hard days, but it's not that God doesn't know about it, right? Okay, let's go to the next question. Um, ver number four, are you experiencing a delay in your own life? Have you considered that this may be a loving response from God? How would you wait patiently while trusting in God's plan and trusting his love for you do you have any Bible verses that you lean would like to lean on? Okay, so just think about it. What is going on in your life that you're like, well, you know, life is really hard and I just, I can't even imagine how difficult this is. Just know that in waiting, sometimes waiting is the right response. It's wait on the Lord, be patient and wait on the Lord. I know that in my life, um, I, uh, my, my husband had a severe heart condition and they wanted to do a, a transplant. And you know, we had to wait a long time, um, over a year, uh, on, because of some insurance issues. And you know, um, during that time, God is healing his heart. And so I am just so thankful if the if we hadn't had to wait, the outcome would have been very different. And, you know, here we got to see God do a miracle. So some of those hard spaces are just to show you the power of God. Um, one of the verses, and if you have a verse that you rely on, that you go to, you know, a go-to verse for you that's encouraging, put it in the comment section and share it with us because I would love to read it. It would encourage me and anyone else that sees it. Um, I'm going to give you this verse. It's Psalms 27. We could have picked so many, but Psalms 27 verses 13 and 14. It says, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart and wait for the Lord. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So that is um, an encouraging verse for me. There are lots of encouraging verses in the Bible. So if you have one, please share it with me. I would love to have it down below. Okay. Uh, question number five says, why were the disciples hesitant to return back to Judea and what was their final decision? Okay. So we're going to look at seven and eight. It says, then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. So after two days, he's like, okay, it's time to go. Let's go. Uh, but Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there. <laughs> so, you know, the last time he almost got stoned, he was trying to, they tried to seize him, and, and now he's like, well, yeah, let's go back. And then they're like, oh, this is dangerous. And then verse 16, we're going to jump ahead and see one of the answers. It says, then Thomas, called Didymus, which means twin, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Like, okay, we're going to go back and we'll just all die together. <laughs> so how interesting, right? I mean, that's what they thought. They thought, well, they're going to, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill us too. Okay. Well, that's what they were worried about. But Jesus said, let's go. Now's the time. Now's the time to go. Let's go. Okay. Question number six, would you be willing to follow Jesus even if it meant you would die physically for him. For the disciples, this was a physical death. But for us, 
we are to die daily to our flesh. How do we die daily to our fleshly passions? And then I gave you two different verses to look at, Colossians and Ephesians. And I just want to think about it. You know, um, I mean, we're all afraid to be a martyr for Christ, right? We really don't want to give our life and die. I, I don't think anybody really does. But you know the principle in the Bible about if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the big things. It's, it's not, I think, that we don't want to die for God. It's that we don't know that we would, you know, have enough will inside of us to say, oh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to die. Because it's scary, right? It's kind of a scary thought. But if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the big things, right? Uh, that's a principle in the Bible teaches to us. And so let's think about dying daily. You know, that's our sacrifice, right? To die daily is a sacrifice that a Christian gives willingly every day, every day, every day. We die to our flesh and we choose life in the spirit. Okay, so let's look at Colossians and I'm gonna put uh, chapter three, verse two. Uh, the first one here, it says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things. And it goes on. I encourage you to go ahead and read it. Uh, so... We used to walk in those ways, but we don't walk in those ways anymore. We're supposed to walk uh, yielded to the Spirit of God, uh, obeying the, the Spirit instead of the desires of our flesh, right? Okay, let's also look at Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. And starting with verse 22, it says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be to be made new in the attitude of your mind, be made new in the attitude of your mind, be made new in the attitude of your mind, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off the old, put on the new. That's what he teaches us. So as we die, like every day, as you, um, you know, as you go through your day and you're like, oh, I shouldn't say that. And, and then don't say it. <laughs> say something good instead, right? Um, when you're tempted to do something or go somewhere, you're like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. You're going to walk in holiness because why? Because it's not because you have to. It's because Jesus paid his, he gave his life. He gave his, he died in death. He took on all of our sins. And just out of a heart of gratitude, Lord, you did that for me. The least I can do is be kind to my family. The least I can do is encourage this person today. You know, I'm hurting, but they're hurting too, Lord. And I'm going to encourage them because I can. Give what you can. You can't give what you don't have. You can only give what you have. So give what you have away. And God will always give you more. Always. He always gives us more. Okay. There's my turn. Okay. Let's go to our next question. And we are in question number seven. Jesus talks about walking in the light because we stumble when we walk in darkness. Then he explains that Lazarus was asleep and he was going to wake him. Finally, in verse 14, Jesus speaks plainly. What does Jesus say and what do you think all of this means? Okay, so there's a lot going on here. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Let's start at verse 9. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve days, hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is written, oh, it is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly. Oh, don't you love it when he tells you plainly? Okay, 
Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So for Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. There's that word believe again, right? What is the most important thing we can do is to believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he came, that he died, that he rose again, right? So he's going to show a really fabulous working of the power of God. And so this is all to help them believe. Okay, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Okay, um, let's look at what do we want to do. It says, then he explains that he was asleep, that he was going to wake him. Finally, he speaks plainly. What does Jesus say? And what do you think all of this means? I think, um, I think there's just two different perspectives. Like Jesus saw him as asleep and, and he says that instead of dead, he finally says, okay, he's dead. According to what you're thinking, he's dead. But you know, I think death is something completely different to God than it is to us. Um, you know, it's just your body is, it's like you're asleep. Isn't that interesting? I don't believe in soul sleep and I believe to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but it just, it just meant something different to Jesus. So finally he's telling him, okay, it's time to go. No, no, he's dead. It's really serious. We got to get there. So here they go. Okay. Let's go to question number seven. Uh, question number eight. When Jesus arrived, Lazarus had already been dead for four days. Many J Jews believe that the spirit stayed near for three days. So now all hope of Lazarus rising was gone. What was Martha's response upon seeing Jesus? And we're going to look at 17 through 22. Okay, so it says, On his ar arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to meet to Mary and Martha to comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Okay, let's stop there. Oh, so he finally gets there and he's, they're, they're so sad. They're like, where were you? Why didn't you come sooner? And what was Martha's response? You know, she just, she just was sad, but then she also had a little bit of hope. She said, but even now, what'd she say? But even, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Wow. So she had hope. She still had hope. But back then, they um, apparently a tradition was that once a body's dead, the spirit kind of hangs around for three days before it leaves. And I, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they were believing. So this is the fourth day. So now nobody's expecting for Jesus to raise from the dead, right? Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that it, it was four days because this would truly be an act of God. Okay, because the spirit would already be gone. Okay, first question number nine, it says, knowing that with God all things are possible and without faith it is impossible to please God, how could you, like Martha, respond in faith as you walk through a difficult situation you are currently facing? Oh my, a difficult situation you are currently facing. What is going on in your life? What is bigger than God? You know, you might think it is, right? But, you know, nothing is bigger than God. And we have to have faith. We have to walk in faith to see um, the answer that we want, that we want to receive. Um, and, you know, if you don't have a problem, if you don't need a miracle, you're never going to see a miracle, right? So I just want to encourage you and think, is that situation in God's hands? Have you put it in God's hands? And then are you waiting on him? Just doing the next thing. We just do the next thing. God doesn't give you the whole plan. He just gives you the next thing. So I encourage you, whatever you're struggling with today, whatever 
um, trouble you're having, that you will give it to the Lord and rest in him and, and believe, believe. It's so important to believe. Okay, let's move on. Number 10, Jesus then had a conversation with Martha about the resurrection of the dead. Back in John 6, 39 through 40, Jesus had said that he would raise people up on the last day. And now they were discussing Lazarus' resurrection. What additional information do you obtain from verse 20, verses 23 through 25? Okay, let's read it. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the re resurrection at the last day. They believed in the resurrection. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Wow. There's so much in this verse. Okay, let's just break it apart. I am the resurrection and the life. So Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So the power to raise us up, you know, when, when, we, when we believe in him, we, our spirits are quickened. You know, we're, we're born again and we're raised to life. And he says, he who believes in me will live even though he dies. So, um, I think we put too much emphasis on the scene, right? The scene is our physical body. Our physical body is going to be buried, right? But our spirit is going to go be with God. So even if we die, we, we don't really die. Our spirit lives because we're born again, because we believe in the Son of God. Whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He, whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Wow. So we don't, you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear dying. You don't have to fear someone else dying if they're a believer. If they're a believer in Christ, that's the most important thing. They'll go and be with God and, and you'll see them again because they've just, they've just changed to a different dimension. You know, they're in the spiritual realm, not in the physical realm. So I think those are things that we really need to just put, wrap our head around and be like, oh, you know, this is very important, and he is very powerful, and Jesus is much more than we give him credit. He is the resurrection and the life. I am. I am. Only God can do that, and he is God, and he is the resurrection, and he can resurrect your, uh, he can pull you out of the pit now in, in physical life, but also in death, he, he'll take you to heaven to be with him. So he is all things, So and to whatever we need at the time we need it, that's what he is. Praise God. Okay, let's go to our next question. Then in verse 26, Jesus says, Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha did confess her belief, and she confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. What did Martha obtain through this belief and confession? Verses 26 through 27. And I'm going to read 27. Yes, Lord. She said to him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Okay, so if she believes, what did she gain? What did she gain? She's gained eternal life. I don't, I mean, I don't know if this is her uh, salvation, but it, it very well could be because we know that we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Um, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. So she right here confessed that she believed that Jesus was the Christ. And that's what we all need to do, confess that Jesus is the Christ. Praise the Lord. Okay, now we'll go to 12. Um, Romans 10, 9 through 10 explains that the process of believing and confessing in more detail. What additional information do you find here? Have you believed and confessed Jesus as your Lord? If not, will you do so today? Okay, so I jumped the gun. But um, have you read this passage? Let's go ahead and read it. This is a, a wonderful passage on salvation. It is Romans 10, 9 through 10. It says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And, you know, I'm just thinking that sometimes people, um, people believe, but they don't confess it. The confessing is as is, is important as the believing. We know that demons believe and they shudder, but they're not saved. They're not gods. 
So part of believing that God, that Jesus is who he says he is and that he came and died and rose again, part of believing and, and the process of being saved is confessing. So, you know, if you've never confessed, you believe, but you've never confessed, then put it down in the comment section, confess. I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord. And you know what? That is salvation. That is the point which your spirit will become alive and God will put the Holy Spirit within you and you will be his and forever uh, his child. So I encourage you, if you haven't done that, please do that today. And if you haven't done that, um, think about why, because you know, the devil is here to still kill and destroy. And if there's any reason that you're thinking in your mind, ah, I don't want to do that, then um, you know, it's a lie because uh, the truth is that God's life is an abundant life. Life with the spirit, life with Christ is an abundant and joy-filled life. So I encourage you to do that and to overcome the uh, temptation to deny Christ. Don't deny Christ. Okay. So Mar Martha had done this. She had confessed and she received salvation. She received everlasting life. And I hope you do too. Okay. Let's go to question number 12. Uh, 13. Martha then runs to tell Mary that Jesus is asking for her. Mary leaves the house quickly and is followed by the friends wanting to comfort her. Then Mary sees, when Mary sees Jesus, she falls at his feet and weeps, wishing that Jesus had arrived sooner. Jesus is deeply moved by everyone's grief and Jesus also weeps. They came to the tomb and Jesus tells them to take away the stone. What is their reaction and what do you think they expected? And this is verses 28 through 41. And you know, I, um, I just want to camp here for a second on come and see Lord. Uh, and then Jesus wept and they say, see how he loved him. And then they said, well, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Of course he could. I, you know, I think um, we're giving emotion. We're given emotions by God. God has emotions. Uh, and right here, the people are sad. The people are crying. Uh, the people are in great grief and sorrow. And then Jesus also wept. And I think he just wept. Um, you know, he loved him. He did love him. But also he wept because this is what sin does. Sin, because of sin, there is death. And so I think that just to feel their grief and to have his own grief he just he just took a moment and he cried it it is okay to cry in fact when you're grieving you have to cry to get that grief out that's part of the grieving process tears are are good um it's good to cry and um it's hard to cry i know that but it's good to cry so if you're grieving for someone i encourage you to cry 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 it's okay because blessed are those who mourn, who mourn, for they will be comforted. God will comfort you in your grief. Okay, so he's uh, he's wept, but now he's looking at this situation. I think they he they don't really want to move the stone away. Um, and Martha says in verse thirty nine, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor, for it has been four days. So. You know, they're afraid what they're going to find when they roll this stone away. Okay, question 14. Then Jesus, Jesus then prays to his father. What is his prayer and why did he pray it? So this is 41 and 42. Um, and let's start at 40. It says, then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Wow. So, by believing in Christ, we're going to see the glory of God. And for us, that could mean, um, you know, I don't know what it'll mean, but it will mean heaven someday for us that we will be with him and we will see it all and we will be amazed. But it could also mean something in your life today. So believe, whatever the situation is, we should believe. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Okay, so he's praying to the Father. He's looking up, Father's in heaven, right? Our Father in heaven. Um, he's looking up to heaven and he's praying. 
And he's saying this out loud because he says, I know that you always hear me, but this is for the benefit of the people. So I think it's interesting that the first thing he does when he goes to heal someone is he pray. He stops and he prays. He looks up and he prays. Um, I think that we might miss that sometimes. You know, the power to do the miracle is always from God. It's not in our own self. It's only in God. So he looks up, he prays, and then there is this miracle, right? So let's see what happens next. Um, and I guess, let's see. And I, why did he do this? I think he, they, he needed, Jesus needed the people to know that the power was coming through God, from God the Father. Okay, after prayer, Jesus calls forth Lazarus. What happens next? What did they do with his grave clothes? And this is 43 to 45, so let's look at that. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off his grave clothes and let him go. <laughs> Wow, this would have been quite a sight. I had a Bible study teacher tell me one time that he said Lazarus. He gave the name Lazarus because if he didn't, if he just said, come out, <laughs> that everybody would have come out, that he would have raised the dead. So um, praise the Lord that he, he just raised Lazarus at that time. It wasn't time for everybody to rise. So Lazarus come out. He came out and then, uh, I mean, I just can't even imagine because he's trying to walk and he's wrapped in all, all this you know, embalming spices and grave clothes. And he's like, take the grave clothes off. So free him, free him, right? So what a scene and what a joyous moment. I mean, I'm sure they were all just, whew, how exciting. Okay, 16, let's go to the last question. We too, we ha too have freedom in Christ. When we confess Jesus as our Lord, we should no longer walk around in our grave clothes. What grave clothes, if any, do you need to shed? So I just want to talk about this a second because when we're when we're saved, um, we are free from our old self. We're free from our old ways. We're free from strongholds, maybe even generational curses from you know years and years of of, of things that have followed your family line. Those things should fall off. Those things should fall off, especially you should be baptized, you know, in water and raised in a new life in Christ and all of that should fall off and you should take all those things off. So I'm going to read this passage from Romans 6, 12 through 14. It says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are no longer under the law, but under grace. Okay, so... Now that you believe in Christ, now that you have confessed, even if today is the first day you did it, you're no longer a slave to sin. You're free from that. You have a new life in Christ. And so I just encourage you to get rid of those old habits, those old ways. And what do you do? You bring them to the Lord and say, Lord, this is, you know, take this from me. Free me from this. I, I no longer want to walk in these ways. And he will. He'll, will. He'll turn your life around and you'll have so much joy and peace and kindness and patience and self-control. It will be wonderful. So I encourage you in that. Okay, we went a little long today. I'm going to read the last uh, paragraph. So let's read that together and we'll close out. Sometimes we think Jesus is late or that he just doesn't really know what's going on. But in reality, his ways and thoughts are so much higher than ours. In this situation, Jesus performed the ultimate miracle, which led many Jews to put their faith in Jesus that day. And Martha and Mary and Lazarus all had a new appreciation for their friend Jesus. May we all continue to yield our will to the fathers as we trust him to do more than we could ask or imagine. God is always working, even when we don't think he is. Be encouraged today to rest in his all-sufficient hands. So that's my encouragement for you today. Rest in his all-sufficient hands. Okay, thanks for studying with me. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next week. Bye.